You like that? Do you want me to actually do anything? Let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> Ronnie, before we get to the joy of sex, let's start with the agony of eight. UK Championships at 17, the Masters followed soon, but winning the World Championship, sir, is a different kettle of fish. Yeah, definitely, yeah, it's the hardest, hardest event, to, you know, because you, you just want to win it once, and then once you've won it once, you kind of got that bit of a monkey off your back. Um, so that's how it felt for me, because obviously everyone was talking me up that I should have won it, maybe earlier than I had. Higgins had won it, Williams had won it. I hadn't yet won it, so there was always that talk of, like, you know, will he win it? So for me, it was um, great to try and put that to bed. When you arrived for the first time, in 1993, mm. do you feel like an imposter in a way because of the the history? Yeah, in, in many ways, you know, like you're you're kind of new new on the bays. You know, there's a lot of the established players there, Hendry, Davis. It was kind of like they're seen as their backyard, really, a little bit like Federer at Wimbledon, I suppose. So, you know, when you turn up to these events, you know, um, you realise, you know, uh, you, you're new to it, you know, and. Um, and, and I remember my first experience there wasn't the greatest experience um, because I wasn't used to playing in front of a full crowd and, and, and big venues. I'd, I'd literally come away from Blackpool. I'd played there for like three months in cubicles, maybe 20, 30 people watching me maximum. No one knew who I was really. Um, maybe obviously people within the snooker world knew who I was, but to the, to the mainstream public, no one, no one knew who I was. I was just some young kid making his debut at the Crucible. So. I, there wasn't the expectation there, you know, obviously I, there was pressure that I'd put on myself because I wanted to do well, you know, it was a dream to, to just play at the Crucible. Um, but because I'd got there, I didn't just think, oh, I'm here and I'm happy, you know, I wanted to try and at least win a match and go as far as I possibly could. So th there was that, the pressure of just the normal sort of pressure. But as far as, um, you know, everyone expected me to do fantastic things, I, I didn't feel that sort of pressure. I was just, just really happy to be there, I suppose. Your first win? was against Dennis Taylor, beaten by John Parrott, back the next year, beaten by Stephen Hendry. And these are the scalps you have to take to come of age. I remember them matches well. I remember Parrott giving me an absolute beast in it. was 13-3. Actually, it didn't even get to a third session. Um, I had a good night that night, though. I was 17, made a few quid, and we was all out partying in Essex. So <laughs> that's what I do remember about that. Um, and I, it was, and I, what I also remember about that as well, I just passed my test and I'd been given this Rover car and I was so eager to get home and I'd, uh, I think I had Kevin Kelly, Jimmy White's friend, sitting in the front oh. and I'm driving through London and this geezer was chasing me because I took a few liberties and I had to get through this gap and basically I was wedged between these two cars and Kevin's going, well, we can't get through, I went, yes, we can. <laughs> and we managed to get through. And I remember that so vividly because it was just crazy times. I was young and made a bit of money and, you know, yeah. it's just all a bit, um, yeah, good, uh, good days. At what stage did the media start applying the pressure of when is he going to win one? Because if you look at um, 1996, the semi-finals, uh, just edged by Peter Ebden, is, a, is that about when you started to feel like, OK, I'm starting to feel the pressure of winning just one, let alone six. No, I think when I started to feel it a little bit was when I think Higgins won it and then Williams won it. And I thought, you know, the three of us were always being compared to each other. So because I hadn't won it, it was always all well, like, you know, is Ronnie good enough to win it? Is there something lacking in his game? So when I did get that first win, it was so much more of a relief feeling mm. um, because then I didn't have to worry about that uh, anymore, you know? In between wins, there's always high moments, and before you'd, you'd won a title in 1997, the famous quickest 147 of, of, of all time. Do, do you remember that in the first round against Michael Price, or do you remember losing a deciding frame to Darren Morgan? Because that's an insight into a sports person's mind. Yeah, I, I remember, obviously, um, obviously you remember the 147 because I was young, um, a massive payday for me at the time, you know, not used to seeing paychecks like that, you know, so that was obviously quite a memorable moment. But then obviously, you know, thinking about losing to Darren Morgan, because obviously you just want to win the world title, you know, every player's dream is to, is to win the world title, you know. Um, so when I lost to Darren, I wasn't coming off thinking, I just thought, you know, I need to work on my game, you know, I need to find a certain level that I can compete over three sessions and, and hopefully in one of them sessions pull away and win matches. So that's, that's what I took out of that, really. As a teenage lad and moving into your, your 20s, 
was it also an element of, I can only imagine if I had had that type of money when I was 18, 19, I would not be sitting here now. Was it also a, an element of the practice maybe wasn't there too because you had such a blind and natural talent and wizardry? And as you say, pile of money, kid that grew up with very little, bang, I'm going to live my life a bit here. Yeah, I did. I think it didn't help with my circumstances because my dad went away when I was 16, literally just after I finished my qualifiers. So that was a massive sort of blow to me, really, and I didn't really deal with that until, well, I did deal with it, but I just kind of blotting it out through drinking and, and partying and stuff like that. Um, and then my mum, obviously, she went away as well. That wasn't so bad because it wasn't such a long one, but it was still kind of mm. like, um, it still wasn't great, do you know what I mean? Um, I remember Elaine Robbie do sand to me one day, you know, and obviously all the people were talking about on the circuit that, you know, Ronnie's losing the plot, he's not the, not the kid he was when he was in the qualifiers, when I had that stability. So, and Elaine Robidoux said to me once, he said, you know, you've got so much ability, this and that, and you're, you're throwing it away. And I, was, I looked at him, was on the, I remember he was on the plane coming back from Thailand, and I thought, you know, it was, it was nice that he was, t it was the first bit of honesty, yeah. because obviously people was talking about it, but no one would say it to my face. And I thought about it, and I, and I remember them words now, and I just think, you know, um, he was right, you know, um, I, I wasn't doing myself any favours. Um, but it, I didn't know any other way through it in, in many ways. So I, it's like I had to go through that to then go, I hit a dead end mm. and thought, you know, I need to address it. So for me, you know, once, um, once I was stopping the drinking and, and I was able to, you know, keep fit, early nights, eat well, and just focus on playing snooker, you know, I was making sure that I had what I needed to, to be competitive, you know. Mm. And then it happened in, in 2001. Hicks, Harold, Ebden, mm. Swale. No close calls getting to the final. Probably as as good as you could picture it to make it the final over what is a marathon. Yeah, when I, when you look back at it, you know you think that sounds like a really really nice draw. At the time, Joe Swell was a, a very very talented good player. Ebden was always a tough player to beat. Hicks was always a danger man. Um, so yeah, you know a lot of them names they don't sound like you'd think you know compared to today's players. But in in that, in that time, it was still. Um, Tough players, yeah, but I remember getting through that, and uh, you know, I remember as well that tournament. I was I was struggling mentally um, with with my my depression. I call it snooker depression, and I think like because I didn't have the drink and mm. to mask all that sort of stuff. I was doing it clean. I, I started getting panic attack and anxieties, and that's when I went on uh, antidepressants mm. uh, just after my first round match because I just couldn't deal with it, and that kind of settled me down a bit, and I was able to at least enjoyed as home without no panic attacks. So that would have been in the, you know, before the first session, antidepressant. It, well, did you time it based on these long sessions? Or no. how, how does that work? No. I'm a bit ignorant with that. No, I was speaking so. to my doctor about a week before, it might have been two weeks before Sheffield, and he said, you know, I want you to try these tablets? And I went, no, no, and I didn't, I didn't want to try them, you know, because I, I was in rehab. They said, like, anything that's mind, mood or in, don't have. And they're like, you, you know, so they was anti sort of any sort of medication. So, mm. and I'd got clean. I thought I've got, I've got to play by the rules, really. Um, but I got to such a point where I was so desperate, you know. So um, I refused to take them until I got during the World Championships, and then I was there, and I just felt so bad, you know. Um, mm. I was doing a, a radio interview, and I was asked, talking to the girl and the fellow on there. And I just cracked up and I said, look, I'm really struggling here. I said, I don't even feel like I can actually get the words out that I need to say. I said, I feel like I'm having like a panic attack, an anxiety attack. And they just went, look, we're really sorry. We'll cut the interview short. And, and that was nice of them. And, mm. and I phoned the Samaritans up that afternoon because I thought, you know, I'd already won like five tournaments that year and I just couldn't shift this anxiety. And I remember playing Ebden in, in a session and dizziness come on me, but I was like 12, four up or 12, five up. But I, I just thought, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to get over the line here because I just mm. felt so out of control. Um, but I managed to get through it. And then obviously uh, the pills get in your system and then I didn't really have so many wobbly moments. But yeah, I had to time when to take them because I didn't want it to affect me when I was playing. Snooker-wise, what do you remember from the Higgins final? Key moments for that was the first session. I went 6-2 up and thinking, well, I've got a nice lead here. But still early days because I know how good Higgins is. And then the other point I remember was when I was 17, 13 up and I, I missed a really easy red in the middle. But I remember just 
thinking, I'm, I've won this now. I'm yeah. just like, what am I going to say? Like, you know, I'm going to be picking the trophy out. I'm going to thank this one. Thank, you know, and all of a sudden, bang, I missed the red in the middle. And I'm like, whoa. And then, and then and any other player, you think, there's a chance I might get back to the table. But John Higgins, you ain't yeah. coming back to the table because yeah. he, he, he is the best in them situations. He clears up and then he goes 40 odd in the next. I'm thinking, here we go. Like, you know, he looked like he found his rhythm. I thought, oh, mate, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I lose this 18, 17 now. And then he missed, and then I come to the table, and like you say, I made uh, what I would consider probably the best 80 break I've ever made in my life, because how I felt inside, I didn't think I could put two or three balls together, let alone an 80 break to, to clinch my first world title. And then I was like, yeah, so for me, that's probably the best 80 break I've ever made in my life. Was there a joy of one? You know, behind the mask, behind the shots, behind the picture and the wall, behind the trophy. Was there a joy of one when you beat Higgins? Were you elated or were you just relieved? Did you want to just get out the door? I felt more of like a relief, you know. If, like when I see my mum and all my friends afterwards, it wasn't like, yeah, yeah, it was like, oh, right. thank God I'd like, you know, got it out of the way, you know. And that night I wasn't so much part, it was just like a huge sort of relief sort of feeling, you know. and. Um, and then the next day you wake up and you kind of think, oh, is this really happening? You know, you know, you got the trophy and you get to speak to the media the next day because they obviously want to speak to you the, the morning after. And then it kind of like settles in. You go, oh. and, then, and then that following week, it's just like you're on a bit of a high and you're sitting there and mm. you can't quite believe that you're, you're actually world champion. So, you know, it was nice. And, um, and like you said, I just think it just settled me down and I was able to just focus on, on playing snooker. I say it's a bit like, when you see a nice car, the person who's driving it doesn't actually get to see the car because he's driving it. I think it's more joy for the people outside looking at it, going, oh, that's a nice car, you can actually see the shape. You don't know what I was going through right. in that tournament. You know, it's like, you know, one minute I'm like, I can't win this. I'm like texting my friends, it's over. And they're like, no, no, you can do this. I went, no, I'm done, I can't. I'm not playing well enough, this ain't, you know. I mean, like, you can do it. And then like eight hours later, wow, that was epic. You just go through so many different sort of yeah. Shifts. Well, two came up, um, and on the surface, if you look at it, you blasted your way there. Quarterfinal session to spur, semi-final session to spur. Yeah. Um, did it, did it feel that easy, or what was the what was the overall the 360 picture? Of um, 2004. I, th I think that's the first year that I've worked with Reardon and I remember I was playing Andy Hicks and uh, I had my first phone call with Ray Reardon and um, I said if I get through this match will you will you like come down and work with me you know he said yep he said no problem I'll be down he said just keep your head on tonight and the first thing he said to me he went Andy Hicks ain't scared of you you know he said keep it tight keep it tight going there and I was like you ain't scared of me and I'd not that I expected him to be scared of me but to have someone like Ray Reard and he was marking my card. Don't think that this is a given. Don't think Andy X is going to bottle it against you. You know, you got to go out there and win this. And I went, and I went out there, and I remember I was so focused. And, and the start of the match didn't go great, or, or that final session. But because I had the, my match head on, I managed to work my way into the game, and I won that. And I definitely don't feel like I was potting as fearlessly as I was. But that safety game just just made me, like what Reardon says, he says, I'm going to make you impregnable. And I went, what does that mean? He went, well, no, no weaknesses, no one can get to you. Yeah. I was like, OK. So um, I had to, you know, I to, I was, he was the master and I was the, the guy trying to learn from, from Ray. So I had, to, I had to do what he said because he, he was right, you know. He wouldn't talk about technical stuff at all. And that was the one thing that really used to annoy me because I thought, I'm just looking for a technical, I'm looking for a swing change here, a, a cue action that I feel like I can take out there and play all the shots. And I go, Ray, look, and, he, and he's just ignoring me, he changed the subject. And I was thinking, like, but don't I get a chance to like discuss what I want to discuss? Isn't it? It's a two-way relationship. And he was like, no, no, just thinking, you know, and 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 I remember I played Hendry, I think it was in the semi-finals, and I missed the ball and I come in, I think it was like, I was like about eight or nine frames up. And he went, What are you doing? Why are you playing that shot? And I went, well, the, he went, no, he says, when you got them under the ground, he said, you, you put your foot on their head and you stamp the concrete on and you just keep going. And I'm looking at him thinking, God, that's a bit harsh, right? But right? Right. 
yeah, but uh, to me it seemed harsh, but actually I was like, you know what, he's right. That's what was installed in me as a kid, you know, never let your opponent get up. But I kind of got lost in the fantasy world of snooker, right. just playing, wanting to play the beautiful game. Yeah. I forgot like these little, these little moments, you know, these, these little moments, you get that wrong, it can be, a, you know, it can swing the momentum to your opponent. And that's what he instilled in me, to, to, to play the right shot, respect the game. Not that I didn't respect the game, but just, you know, play the percentages, you know, yeah. get that ball. And then if you don't get that ball, weld him, you know, and don't just put it on the back cushion, stick him where it's a nightmare place for him to be. So. But was he with you in the dressing room during the final? Would you talk to him at yeah. mid-session? So what did he say when you were four down after the first break? You would go out and lose the next room to go five down against Graham Dutton in yeah. the final. And then absolutely just not knock blow the doors off it and and win 18 yeah. but what what because you're you're a cr you're credited in the second of the joy of six yeah. to reardon and, yeah. and his importance what did he have to say then i love it um, i love the idea like because it <laughs> i love the idea now it could be anything because he's not tech like did he give you a good shoeing you know, it was quite weird because obviously i've worked with a guy um who worked with me for years dell mm. and he was like we were like good friends and um and a coach for quite a long time and um, I was at the, got to the final, and I hadn't seen Del for about eight or nine, ten days. You know, all of his players had got beat, and at ten to three, I walked into the practice room to do my practice, and there's Del getting balls out for Graham Dot. <laughs> so straight away, my head was gone. I thought, like, it's like this this guy that I've shared my life with, and I haven't seen him here all tournament, but yet he's come up here at the final, and it just sort of like threw me off a little bit. Wow. So I didn't know how to kind of deal with that, and I went to Ray. I went, I can't believe it. It's like. Like a family member has gone on to the other side of the, you know, gone against me. And Ray was like, he couldn't understand it. He was like, oh, don't worry, just go and play the game. It's all right, doesn't that? But it, it, in my head, I couldn't really focus on the game. It's crazy. I, was, I was thinking more about that. So I go 4 0 down, I come in, and Ray's like, well, what's happening? Why, what's going on out there? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, Ray. I said, I just don't feel like I get, you know. And he went, don't worry, don't, don't take, you know. And then, and then we just kind of just got back into the game and you know there's still a long way to go first to 18 but yeah that was I've never really told that story but actually that that's the truth you know did that turn to anger at any stage during that because it yeah. would to me I'd be yeah. like right I now oh, really oh. right who are you taking balls out for let's see where you are at the end of this no match. I did actually phone him up during after the first session and, and we had a quite a heated discussion on the phone not from Dell's side he was pretty calm and placid <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really like said what I what I felt I had to say and I regret some of the things that I said but at, at the time I really felt it you know and um, and actually as I'm talking to him I could see him pacing around the car park I was in my room and I could see him down there. but I didn't let him know I could see him and uh, yeah, it was just one of them things. And you know, we didn't speak for a long time. And, and then I, I think about four or five months ago, I, I phoned him up. I said, hello, Del, how are you going? And I, I pretended to be some Russian dude that wanted some coaching lessons. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I, went, it's WC. I said, it's me, Ronnie. And he went, oh, how are you? So um, yeah, and he sent me a text, good luck before the World Championship. So, you know, it was just one of them moments, you know. Yeah, time heals. Yeah, and like you said, you know, I credit Ray with a second, but I credit him with a third, fourth, fifth and sixth, as I think he changed me as a player. Uh, 2007, that was the doozy, because you claimed the draw was fixed and then had to apologise for it after. Did I? Yeah, I <laughs> exactly, right, exactly. Did I? Because you, <laughs> you got ding again. And oh, they yeah, said, yeah, yeah. who do you think's going to win the World Snooker? And you said the bookmakers, which is literally like yeah, yeah, as yeah. big a clanger. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. OK, that's a proper kind of monster pigeon. <laughs> but that's part and parcel, isn't it? Yeah. That's, I, yeah. You know, it's what you get. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of what you get with Ronnie O'Sullivan. You, you do, don't yeah. know. I think what it is, is I thrive on a drama. I think if, I set my, if, I, if I've done something and I think, oh, I put my foot in it here, I think, oh, right, that's a real good G for me to go and play better snooker. And sometimes I feel like I need to create some sort of enemy, yeah. if you like, you know, right. whether that's world snooker, whether that's another player, whether that's whatever it is, it's sort of like I kind of go, okay, that's sort of, that's my, that's my cue to get my head in gear, forget about the cue action, forget about whatever. I've got to win this now. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is just this is about me putting everything on the line and getting the job done. Um, and it's worked, you know. I just think I'm one of them people that thrives on on something, you know, something going wrong in my life. You know, it's like I I, I love to sort of try and turn it around, if you like, and make a, a not such a good situation into a fantastic outcome. Prove people wrong. 
in a way, I suppose, yeah. And I think I've just done that all my life, you know. Um, even as a youngster, even at school, you know. I, if someone said you can't do that, I'd be like, all right, brilliant. Love, I love hearing I can't do something. That's like, <laughs> that's the best thing to say to me, you know. So I like it when a few players have said certain things in the past and I thought, oh, beautiful. I've won so many tournaments off the back of even commentators. There was a certain commentator, it was a friend of mine, he said, oh, I think, you know, Ronnie's the top boy, but I think this thing's um, a bit special and he's got something to think about. And I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, I thought, oh, and that was the year I beat Ding in the final. The third title in 2008, Stephen Hendry said of the semi-final, it was the best snooker you'd ever played. Mm. He was, for someone who just got beaten in a semi-final, he's yeah. Arguably the most cutthroat snooker player of all mm, time. Mm. Post match was like, I have never seen mm. Ronnie O'Sullivan play snooker like that. Yeah, I always say I think I think 2007, start of 2007 season when I won the UK at the Maxi against Selby and, and beat, I won the UK. I beat um, Maguire in the final, 10-1. I always say that season was probably my best ever season play-wise, which led into the 2008 World Championships. And I remember coming into that tournament, again, I felt I made the boo-boo in um, talking about things that I need something to get me going. I was in China, that was the year I'd done the China interview with a microphone. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that one. Yeah. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Well, that was, uh, that was in March, and then obviously the World Championship start, started in April, and I thought, I could be in trouble here. This could, this could be the time they actually ban me, because mm. no one wants to upset China. Going into that World Championships, I thought, what's the best way to try and stick this fire out? Because it was a bit of a fire. And I thought, I've got to try and win this, you know? So not only did I win it, I got the 147. And if you notice in that tournament, when I got the 147, I went like that. And I never normally do that, but that was my way of going, try and ban me now. <laughs> so it's something to hit. It was someone, yeah, it was like, it was like the, the authorities were on me. And I just thought, right, how do, how do I silence them? And that was the only way to do it, through, through playing good snooker or doing something quite memorable where they think we want to get rid of him but actually he's good for business but I remember that year I was I was hitting the ball so well and that was the first year I started reading the Joe Davis book I call it the Bible yeah um, and I remember sitting in my mate's snooker room 2007 it was and I went what's this book here Joe Davis so, you know obviously I knew Joe and I read it and I went you know what he's t he talks a lot of senses <laughs> he knows what you're talking about funny enough so I thought you know what I'm just gonna like do what he says so I read it and read it and read it and read it and then gradually, like, my practice form was so good, and I was thinking, God, I ain't played like this for years. If I could take this on the match day, well, I'd be flying. But, and I did. I kind of took that form into matches. And I remember I just was cutting through opponents, like, unbelievably. Like, I was bang, bang, bang. You know, I was winning three, four frames, quick visit, hundreds, nineties, eighties. And when you're scoring well at Sheffield, it's kind of quite an, e it's quite an easy job, in, you know, to, to, to get through matches, because you're mm. one visit snooper. Um, over the long distance, and um, you know, and I managed to win that tournament as, as probably as comfortable as any ever any other tournament I've ever won. Twenty eleven, even though the as I say quarterfinals again, John Higgins beat you thirteen ten. Yeah. This is when Steve Peters came into to Ronnie O'Sullivan's world and, yeah. and has been there ever since. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was the first time. I remember uh, the two previous years I was struggling with, with stuff off the table. I think I went six tournaments without actually winning a match. So I remember coming to 2011 thinking I probably had, had enough of playing, you know. I thought at the end of my career, mid-30s, no one really won anything. Um, but then I tried obviously working with Steve Peters. I thought it was always worth one more throw of the dice, you never know. Always keep an open mind. And this guy obviously come with a lot of pedigree. Um, and for the first 15 minutes, I was like closed. I thought, I, don't, I actually don't want him to help me. I don't mm. want him to kind of give me any hope in a way. Um, so I was kind of a bit closed. And then all of a sudden, after about 15 minutes, I thought, oh, this geezer's, this geezer's he's super intelligent. You know, I thought, this geezer's, oh, even, if he, even if he can't help me with snooker, I'd love to come and see him once a week and talk to him for an hour because yeah. he's fascinating. You know what <laughs> I mean? I'm like, who is this fella? First thing he said to me is, I'm not going to tell you to be positive. He said, because that's a waste of time. And I went, yeah. I was like, wow. Brilliant. <laughs> right, yeah, where where do we go from there then? You know, yeah. like, if you're not telling me to be positive, like, what, there must be some sort of secret you've got here that you kind of works. And any kind of like when I started, and, and the great thing was, I would talk to him 
for an hour and I'd soak it all up and I'd put my microphone on just in case I forgot what he says and I'd write loads of notes and he said right come back and he said and write the questions down and, and he, he always tells the story he said Ronnie come back he said and he got this big notepad and there was like 20 or 30 questions and I just soaked it all up and I knew that this worked for me you know every time I apply what he says it, it actually it's, it's the best mental thing I've ever done in my life. When you beat Ali Carter again in the final this to win your four of six 18-11 at 36 you were 55 days older than Dennis Taylor when he won in, in 1985. So the oldest world champion since the man himself, Ray Reardon, in 1978. Statistically, you were being backed up. And I wonder, even to now, do you fear being the over-the-hill snooker player? The um, guy who can't win anymore and can't give up playing, <laughs> right? Because yeah. I think that must be your idea of hell. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely wouldn't. I, I, I honestly don't think I could accept sort of playing and putting that effort in and not getting, you know, um, not have, at least having a chance of win tournaments. So, yeah, you, you're always looking for for that sign as a sportsman because no one wants to to go on any longer than they really should do in, in many ways. That was probably my the best I'd ever played from start to finish in the World Championships, without a doubt, you know, I felt like I was striking the ball. Um, my cue action was absolutely on line, bang on point, you know. Um, the, even the ball was making a different sound when it hit the back of the pocket, you know, so many clean shots going in. And that just builds so much confidence within you. And there, there was a one moment during the, in that World Championships where I thought, oh, this might not be going well, against Neil Robertson. I think I was 5-3 down after the first session. But I recovered really well and ended up playing some fantastic snooker um, in that match and beat Neil, I don't know, it was 13-9 maybe. So um, yeah, that for me, that is, as, a, as a player and for someone that, you know, gets great joy out of striking the ball well, for me, that is definitely the best and most enjoyable world championships that I've, I've ever had, you know. And a good place to call it a day, right? Good place to just say, yeah. that's it, Q goes up, and this is a year yeah. of no snooker. Yeah, You look yeah. through your record, it's all blank, it's all blank, yeah, it's yeah. all blank, and then yeah. you defend successfully yeah. your world title. It mm. is phenomenal. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Mm. It's outlandish. Mm. It's a film script, not real life. Mm. So talk me through that year. Because you walked out of there, and the next yeah. rooms you played in earnest was a year later at the Christmas. Yeah. I think what it was was is because I think a whole year building up in that 2011, 2012, I'd played a lot of good snooker and apart from winning the German Open, which was like February, and then I won the Worlds, I thought, God, you know, like I've played so much snooker and I, I hadn't really got, if I didn't win the Worlds, I'd have looked at that season and thought, God, it's not a very good return for what I'd, the amount of effort and work I'd, have, I'd put in. You know, I remember that year I was up and down the M1 so much playing in the PTC events at Sheffield uh, Institute of Sport. And I just got to the point where I just felt I just couldn't do the driving no more. I was just so tired, so exhausted. And I just thought, you know, I'm, I don't want to be on the road 24-7, you know. Um, so I just, I just kind of looked at it and just thought, well, maybe it's not, not the right setup for me. I should point out that during this year's sabbatical, in between back-to-back -back world titles, you did what all great sports people do. You went to work in a pig farm. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be honest with you, that was hell. But it really? Was right. You said yeah. it was great at the time. It was great because there was no pressure, but actually right. when I got on pig duty, I went in there and it stunk, and they went, right, right you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And I went, oh, mate, you know. If, but, but for me, I, was, I wasn't getting out of bed till 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I really got super lazy. Yeah. And I thought, I need a volunteer job because I'm not, I'm not doing a paid job where someone can tell me what to do. Like, at least I had yeah. the option to go, you know what, I ain't doing this. Yeah. But that's not my makeup, you know. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. So I thought, I'll get the volunteer job. So like, there's, there's the out cards of like, you know what, I'm, I'm not coming back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> How many days did you last? I've done about six weeks there. If I had been a top snooker player in that era, mm. Even if I'd have liked you before, yeah. I would have found it hard not to hit you. You'd, you'd been out for a year. Mm. I'd went all around the world. Mm. I'd practiced every day. Yeah. I came into the world in good form. Yeah, I know. And then this speech, after a year off, mm. spent six weeks working on a pig farm, mm. comes in and wins a world title, and retains yeah. the world title. I only had about six weeks practice. 
You can and, see and, why that might be great. And, 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 <laughs> and I'd written my autobiography within that six weeks. So I, because wow. I'd, I'd signed up to write the book, and they, I went, can't it wait till after the world? So I went, no, it's got to be released after the world. So I went, I only got six weeks practice anyway. So I was actually yeah. spending seven hours a day for two weeks with my mate Simon doing the book and fitting my practice in as well. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a bit nervy because I thought I just wanted to devote all my preparation time to snooker, but I couldn't, you know. Yeah. Um, I had a book to write as well. So um, yeah, it was a distraction sometimes quite good, I think. Right, there you go. So year off, write the autobiography, win it, mm. great. <laughs> going to this year's World Championships, it didn't feel like the circus, you know, it was so quiet, so, re you know, it was just a pleasure to be at, at Sheffield, so there was a part of me that thought, I want to hang around here a little bit longer, you know, even if, even if there's no cure action um, for like 80% of the time of the matches that I played, I still enjoyed just sort of going to the, the coffee shops, eating at the restaurants, you know, relaxing in the hotel, which was like a two minute walk from the venue. And I was just like, you know, I'm never ever going to get to probably experience the World Championships like this again. So there was a part of me where, if you like, my chimp, as Steve Peters would say, was really calm, relaxed, wasn't looking out for, you know, any potential distractions, you know. Um, I was just able to just go and practice, enjoy the Crucible and, and enjoy Sheffield and, and had a fantastic time there this year. I'm playing a match at 10 o'clock, quarter past nine, I'm in my suit, sitting in, sitting in the cafe having having a nice breakfast, chilling out, chatting to, to everyone that was sitting around, you know, and that's, that's unusual, you know, you, you'll never get that again at Sheffield. In your first round game, 10-1 over Tepchaya Anu, mm. 41 minutes faster than the previous fastest ever game at the Crucible. That was brutally brief from Ronnie O'Sullivan. He is in the mood for a six world title on that evidence. 41 minutes mm. to knock that off a record mm. is Ben Johnson drug test ter territory, <laughs> isn't it? That's, that's crazy. The, your shot time was under 14 seconds, but yeah. I remember at the time you said, I didn't think it was playing that no, fast. No, I mean, uh, uh, the minute you feel like you're playing too quick, you do, you go, hold on, I, you know, uh, I feel a bit careless here and I feel like I'm, I'm not in my efficient, efficient gear, if you like. Mm. So. You know, like I said, you know, I come off there and it felt quite clinical, felt quite controlled. And, you know, when you start telling me the shot time, I think that's just ridiculous. I, I can play that quick and yet feel like I'm, I'm not speeding around the table. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was definitely um, getting on with it pretty quick. Moving on to the semi-finals, Ronnie, and the two final sessions on that Friday. One of, if not the best day of snooker I have ever, ever watched. Yeah for how bad it was and for how good it was. So, so Miguel Karen Wilson, the decider, yeah. is right up there with 85 for me. Yeah. And it was almost like <laughs> you and Selby were in the dressing room watching that and you both went, hold my beer. And uh, out you came. And we, we had this period where the commentators are saying, he's given up the game. This is disrespectful. He doesn't even want to be here. He doesn't want to win it, blah, blah, blah. You told me before the game. Mm. I'll put that in record. Mm. You told me before the game, mm. if he gets me in this safety battle, mm. I, I won't repeat the exact words. I'll take a few swear words out. I'm going to smash these balls up. Mm. So you'd already kind of you ah, kind of told yeah, the boys yeah. in the Eurosport studio that was going to be the tactic. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, like I said, you know, at this stage of my career, there's no point me wasting energy, um, getting too many scars, getting too punch drunk getting to the point where more of it is challenging rather than relishing it. So for me, it's about keeping the game on my terms. And that semi-final was absolutely no, no different. Through that whole match, you know, uh, you get a sense of, uh, am I, uh, do I deserve to win this match? And I think at 13 all, I remember putting my cue down, going to the toilet thing, I've made the score respectable. If I lose 17 13 there, no one's going to say, oh, we got slaughtered. It's hard to know where to pick the comebacks up because the 13 9 to 13 all was phenomenal because yeah. it was two frames at the end of a session and yeah. two frames at the start. So that takes a whole different mind. Yeah. But it's the two breaks, the 138 and the yeah. 71, mm. when he needs one frame yeah. and it's 16 14. Yeah. Phenomenal. My hair was standing up on end watching mm. that. It mm. was. But I. I don't think you lived it the way we lived it watching mm. it. When it got to 16-14, I 
I thought, I'm not going to fudge my way over the line, so I need to find three quick frames, big breaks, go for my shots. And yeah, I took on probably a couple of shots that maybe earlier in the match I wouldn't have taken. But at this moment in time, it was like, if they go in, it could, it could kickstart me onto much better things. And it's only three frames. It's like, it's like the last mile of a 26 mile marathon. You know, you, you go, I'm going for it now. And if I die, I've only got 200 meters to go. And um, I managed to get a little bit closer to the table and it helped me with my timing a little bit. So I was able to get a grip of the white and I was able to, to manipulate the balls a lot easier. So I went from thinking I needed two or three chances to win a frame to thinking, you know, half a sniff, I can, I can clear these balls up. And, and, I, and I found a little bit of form and I thought, if I can just hold this for three frames, I'm going to be able to compete with him. And, you know, um, even if it was safety battles, I thought, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got good, good feeling on the white ball at the moment. And um, like you say, the one for eight was a, was a great break, you know, um, hardly put a foot wrong. And then obviously the last frame, get in, bang, scoring. And then, you know, I missed the red on 64, I think it was. And I thought, oh, here we go. I've done, you know, I've, I've found the magic, but yet I've just, I've collapsed, you know, I've, I've, I've not killed the frame off when really I should have done. And, uh, you know, he managed to get back into it. And then, like you say, towards the end of that frame, oh, mate, it was just unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. Like to, to win that type of frame against Selby, the final frame, after three days of, you know, you know, a couple of safety shots I played there, I, I watch them back and I just think, yeah, that was, that was lovely stuff. Oh, that's a brilliant shot. At this time, there was a plan. Oh, he's caught the jaw. Goodness me. He only needs the red. He's got the red. Ronnie O'Sullivan has come back from the brink, 16-14 down. He's won three on the bounce in the most sensational fashion. The first session in the final, you've raced out a 6-2 lead against Karen Wilson, who's made his first world final. Mm. Even at that stage, the likes of Stephen Henry was saying, I, I tend to think this is over. Jimmy White was saying, that, it's a long way to come back. Mm. E even in the final, did, did you get a feeling at that stage, this title's mine? Um, no, not really, because I think if, if it, the form that I'd shown in 2012 and 2013, I'd have probably deep down gone, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good lead. I'm playing very, very well. I don't see how he's going to be able to dominate me in, all th in the next three sessions. If anything, I'm going to pull away even more. That would have been my, my natural feeling. But this year, obviously, like I said, you know, and I've alluded to it before, I didn't feel like I was striking the ball or, or hitting enough solid shots to have that confidence that I was able to withhold any sort of storm. So, like you see in the second session, he kind of come out playing well, and I just didn't feel like I could match him. But I, I managed to, to, to come out that session 5-4. How I managed to get four frames out of the session, I really, really don't know. The third session was just mm. wipeout snooker. Yeah. Just talk me mm. through that from your point of view. Because this game can be the worst in the world when it's yeah. not clicking, Yeah. and you said it can feel like the easiest game yeah. when it does. Yeah. For that moment on the biggest stage yeah. in the world, yeah. did that feel at that moment like, oh, this, this is my team. Yeah, I must admit, uh, I think that final was won probably 10 o'clock in the morning on the practice table at the Crucible. I found, I changed my grip, it, it changed my timing, I was hitting solid shots, um, I was able to play blind, blind shots well, so where you're potting a ball and you can't see the pocket, they were going in the middle, and I just thought, lovely, that, I, I'm now going to take that into the world final it, on the final day. I've got a bit of a cue action. No matter what he throws at me, at some point he's going to make a mistake. I'm confident that I'm going to be able to, to win the frame in one visit and build momentum from there. You said that you've made speeches in your head before the finish yeah, line yeah. and you went, I'll never do that again. Yeah, but never, yeah. when you're going into the evening, you know you only got a one, one frame. Yeah. It's done in 11 minutes. Yeah. But like, what, are you, what are you thinking going out? Is there a little bit of like, oh, this is a bit awkward? Uh, <laughs> No, because you always want to just get the match over and done with as quickly as you can. You know, if it happens to go the, uh, the distance, you know, so be it. But from 17, 8, I think it was, there was I, I knew there was virtually no chance of me losing the game. Even if I'd have had a terrible session, I still fancied, you know, um, yeah, at some point it was over. But uh, now I was over, over, over the moon to, to 
win it so convincingly in the end, you know. The unique, the unconventional, the irrepressible, the brilliant Ronnie O'Sullivan stands once again on top of the snooker world. This colossus of the Green Bays has conquered the Crucible for a sixth time. You know, to enjoy being at the event without the circus was great. And then obviously at the end, the final, you know, it was an early night, which was fantastic. We was all able to go back to the hotel and have our own little party. And, and you know, it was probably one of the funniest nights I've ever had. You know, a few close friends come up and, you know, we just really, yeah, it was probably the best after, by a mile was the best celebrations afterwards. You know, I've, I've never laughed so much. So how, as you left your sixth title, hmm. Do you, do you put it in the perspective? The first one was just like massive relief. And if I never win it again, who cares? Um, the next few was about, you know, trying to, you know, build your CV and trying to get as many world titles as you can to kind of say, well, you know, I'm up there with the, with the, with the greats. Um, and I think four and five made me feel like I'd put myself in the Davis, Hendry, John Higgins sort of category. Absolutely. And I think the sixth one was more enjoyable in many ways than all of them, if you like. Um, not because of the way I played, but just because there was no pressure on me. So I was actually able to enjoy this tournament probably more than any others, just because I didn't feel like anyone expected me to go all the way this time, whereas in previous years, there's always been that, you know, it's Ronnie's to lose, if you know what I mean. Final question, in 20 years from now, Kids mm. playing snooker. It's yeah. a bit like your Joe Davis book. Mm. And the dad goes, watch this documentary. Mm. That'll show you how Ronnie O'Sullivan, mm. the genius, won six world titles. Or will he say to his yeah. son, don't watch that. Watch the follow-up, Seventh Heaven. <laughs> What's most likely? Two or three people that I trust a lot. They went, it wouldn't surprise me if you win it next year. And I'm thinking, they no, they, no one said that for four or five years. Right. And I'm thinking, do they know something I don't know? And again, they can sit, they've got a different view of it to what you have. I'm, I'm, I'm overly excited to have won the six and never thought there'd be another one since 2014 because I hadn't really devoted my life to wanting to win one. It was more about enjoying the game. But, um, you know, I'm, 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 you know, now I've got a practice facility. Um, who knows, you know, I might be, if I don't win it next year, I don't think I'll win it again, put it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, Colin. <laughs>